All right. Great. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to Tech Chat Tuesday for Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. I'm Ken Rimple. I'm Becca Rufford. <laughs> and we have Michael Geiss here today from Chariot. Michael is, what, what do you call yourself here? What's our, what's our title for you? Um, I am a, I think I'm a UX slash product design consultant. And I say I think because the titles are all over the place these days, but yeah. Yeah. But in terms of what you do, uh, so so then you make uh, video games then? <laughs> so the titles are always wrong, you know. Hi, I'm a senior sanitation engineer. Um, but no, thank you. <laughs> Welcome, and thank you for being here. And uh, we're going to talk today. We brought Michael on to talk specifically about UX and user interface design and UX, user experience. Um, and so we'll do that in a little bit. We're going to start with our dev news just a little bit. And so, uh, Becca, you have a few articles for us, right? I do. Um, so dev news is more des news this week for design related <laughs> stuff. Let's see Add my screen here. So the first that I have is dark patterns. Um, this is a this is definitely a UX topic, and dark patterns are basically using using basic UX patterns that we're all familiar with for evil. Um, so at best they're annoying, and at worst they can seriously harm users. Um, so this is like making it so that you might accidentally click add to cart when maybe you didn't mean to. Um, that's just an example. So they have um, I've heard of dark patterns before but I've never seen them categorized quite like this. Um, so this website, darkpatterns.org, breaks them down into these 12 main categories of just of dark patterns. Um, so I noticed there's Roach Motel, which is an example where you can get into a situation really easily, but it's hard to get out of it. So like oh, signing yeah. up for a premium subscription. Um, this one I really liked. Um, it's called Privacy Zuckering, which I just like the verbification of Zuckerberg's last name. Uh, <laughs> and it's uh, when you're tricked into publicly sharing more information about yourself than you might have intended to. Um, I The other day I was like on a website and you get the pop up at the start that's like sign up for our newsletter maybe. Um, and you're like, I don't wanna sign up for the newsletter. I don't wanna drop my email in that box. So you like look for a way to X out of the modal, but there's no X. There's just a link that says something like, no thanks, I don't wanna stay up to date on the best business practices. Um, <laughs> you know, so like for example, that's called click shaming or they call it confirm shaming here. Mm -hmm. uh, the act of guilting the user into opting into something. So this website, darkpatterns.org, what I liked about this is, like I said, it was just an interesting way to kind of like typify um, these dark patterns. And they also have a really fun hall of shame, too, which is basically their Twitter account where people call out companies or products who are kind of using these dark patterns that they run into. So worth a read, fun to look through. You know, I, I consider myself an adult and I consider myself having reasonable reasoning skills. And yet... I am so dumb when it comes to clicking on things like, and, and I normally am very careful, but I'll be on Twitter. I'll be in my little world researching some things that's getting me all riled up and I'll see something I'm like, oh, wait a second, that's useful information. I click it and it's a stupid clickbait. Let's click 50 times to get to the point you were going to make article. And I, every time I'm like, I'm the biggest idiot on the planet. And then I go back and everyone's like, clickbait, 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 clickbait. And I'm like, why am I so dumb that I keep clicking on this crap? You know? yeah. <laughs> that's the only one that really gets me. Another one I see all the time are the disguised ads. Like it'll, yeah. the visuals will look just like the rest of the site and it'll look like it's meant to be just another item in the list. Yep. And before you know it, you're you're somewhere else clicking on something you shouldn't be. Yep. Dig.com is good for that when you go on a dig and look, you know, because I always liked the Dig Nation podcast years ago when they were talking about goofy things on the internet. So every once in a while when I run out of things to look at, I'm like, I'll go to dig.com and see what's going on in the social verse. And there'll be like every eight of them is like they're selling something. But it looks, if you didn't look at the one and a half point font that says advertisement, you know, you, you right. click on it and go, oh, I got suckered again. Right. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, cool. So that's darkpatterns.org and they're yep. all shame. Yep. Very nice. So then we've got um, another thing too. So I've been seeing this all over the internet and I was like trying to type in, trying to figure out what it's called. So it's an illustration pattern that... For people who are listening to the podcast and not looking at a screen, yeah, right. how would you guys describe this? I don't know, Michael. You're the, mm -hmm. you're the artistic one of the two of us. Flat design, mostly with uh, elongated action. 
and wavy, like, right? Yeah. A lot of curves for the people. Yeah, like the leg does not bend. Yeah. yeah, there's a woman running on the on the, on the one panel, and I'm like, is that plastic woman running? What is that? There are no <laughs> joints in her arms and legs. It's just right. Weird. Uh, the poor people who are listening to this. So. <laughs> Imagine a world where everything is a curve. Yeah. Hmm. Say, uh, and and past alley. Yeah. A, tw- a 2020 internet caricature. Yes. Yeah. It yes. Really so uh, there's I'm... one picture. Hold on. Wait, go back down a little bit. So for people on the audio, there's one that looks like it's a bunch of plants because I think there are plants or something in there. And everyone is growing out of the middle of the, of the scene like they're plants. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. really weird. Really weird so, stuff. so what, I've been like seeing this everywhere and I didn't know what the word for it was. And so me trying to like type this into Google to turn this specific thing up just sounded like us trying to describe it to audio listeners. Right. Um, and I, I managed to turn it up. So there's a word for this illustration style that's like very pervasive and it's called corporate Memphis. Um, oh. It's also called Alegria, which is a uh, Portuguese Spanish uh, for joy. So and so this is this this style that a lot of companies, especially tech companies, are kind of starting to adopt lately. And you probably recognize it or have seen it before. But um, the article that I read about it was really, it kind of took like a hot take on this. And this is what I like. So um, the, t- the title is, Don't Worry, These Gangly Armed Cartoons Are Here to Protect You From Big Tech. Um, and one of the lines is, their palpable joy is friendly, approachable, inviting, all of which translates to trustworthiness. But the political pr- predicament that this style faces has less to do with the aesthetic itself than it does with the harmful corporations for which it's become sort of this happy kinetic face. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. So this was kind of the take that this article was was uh, putting a spin on this style. So I'll go ahead and drop that link. Yeah. Let's see. You want to read more about that? But just good to know. Kind of gave me a new wrinkle in my brain as to like what that style is even called. My name is Corporate Memphis. I'm Corporate Memphis. How you doing? <laughs> Wait, let me get over the mic. My name is Corporate Memphis. Yeah. Anyway, Corporate Memphis, that's a really strange name for something. Well, yeah. I guess, and a, a lot of them are seemingly employees having fun at work. <laughs> Right, right. They're all kind of like business casual, leaping around like office plants and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When you don't have any joints to work with and you're perfectly fine <laughs> bending over air, you, you can have a lot of fun at work. So, sure. you know, if you're on the podcast, check that link out, man. That's just some weird stuff. Okay. Who knows? We'll all be using it tomorrow with our designs. <laughs> Suddenly, in some rounded corners, we have rounded windows. You know. All right. Okay, and then last thing here we have is what's the deal with self view on zoom calls? So like this article kind of goes into like, why do we have to see ourselves on zoom calls? Um, Like what were kind of the design decisions um, to make that the case? So um, there was a study that was done again, I'll link the article that basically said that if you're on a zoom call with a bunch of people and you're able to see your own face, the call was like a, a significant amount less productive than if people couldn't see their faces and could only see the people that they were interfacing with. Hmm. Um, so this article goes into the history a little bit, like all the way back. 2001 to, A Space Odyssey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's and from. The 1964 World Fair in New York, which apparently was the first video call. Like that's where that was kind of unveiled. And oh. the self view was supposed to be um, like just a kind of like way to check yourself, like before you walk out the front door to go to an event or something like, you know, everything's looking good. I'm ready to take this call. And then it would flip the screen to the person that you were having a call with. Um, now, it, there's no it, it was just kind of like examining some of these design decisions. But um, one of the, the topics that I found was interesting was this new tech called uh, the square. And so the square kind of aims to like make video calls a bit more interactive by making them this parallax view, like you can see right here. So the square almost looks like a window mounted on a wall and the person in the video. So if I'm looking at a person in the video, their screen is moving parallax to the way that I'm moving. Um, So I can see their sort of 3D space. And another interesting thing is it presents people in one-to-one size. So they're not just these little tiny faces on your screen. You're seeing one-to-one the person sitting in front of you. Um, So this was just one of the solutions offered by this article um, of interesting tech to watch. 
coming ahead, especially as we're all using Zoom constantly now. Yeah, and everything's kind of scanning to see where people are in, you know, physical space now. You've got phones have LIDAR, starting to have LIDAR to really get accurate about where things are. And I just wonder if you could break that thing in half by having one person on the other end moving in the opposite direction. That's right. Yeah. Sudden, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. What am I doing? No. Um, but yeah, that's cool stuff. That's really interesting technology. And just kind of applying kind of a almost like a motion picture kind of sense, you know, mm-hmm. like the dolly shot into right. like having a video school. That's really cool. Yeah. Actually. I mean, the, the effect, it really looked like they're in the room next to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so neat. It's really cool. All right. So that's the dev news. I do want to announce one quick thing while we're here. Uh, let me bring this up tomorrow. Um, and this is because I'm prepping for it like crazy. Um, tomorrow we have a gig coming up. Where, where's my screen? Oh, there we go. Hold on. I'm learning how to use this. It's only been like 20 of these podcasts. All right, there we go. Java at 25. So I'm doing this tomorrow with uh, our CTO, Aaron Mulder, Tracy Wilson-Rossman, uh, and we have a special guest as well for the second half of it. So Java at 25. Believe it or not, Java is, as, as someone put it when I was researching it, we've reached the silver jubilee of Java. Okay. Um, but it means it's 25 years old. <laughs> And I remember when I first used Java, uh, and so it was like 23 years ago. Um, so, you know, a lot of us at Chariot have worked with Java for most of our professional careers in the software development space. And whether it's Java or it's a language running on the JVM, like Scala or Clojure or Groovy or JRuby or whatever else, JPython early on, uh, you know, the bottom line is this has been the platform that runs a ton of technology. Um, so we're going to go over uh, in our first event, which is called Drinking the Coffee, Chariot's Multi-Decade Journey with Java. This is Aaron and myself and Tracy talking about how we've done Java over the years, why we selected it in the first place, um, you know, the, the, the kind of the path through Java as a web technology and then to, you know, Spring and, you know, uh, you know, in, in, uh, different uh, business to business servers and REST services and all these other things, and then these different languages. So we'll talk about those. We'll talk about some of the dead ends we might have run into here and there, some success stories, and just how it's we're still working with it today. So that's kind of the first half. We're going to take about 45 minutes to do that, kind of to set the table. And then our special guest, who uh, he's been uh, so uh, open and helpful with us on this event, uh, Brian Getz. Now, Brian Getz works for Oracle as the Java language, the Java language architect at Oracle. They have a bunch of architects, or I shouldn't say a bunch, but they have a collection of them that do things like the Java development kit and the Java virtual machine and other things. But he is the one that's shepherding the Java language along, which is going to be really interesting. So uh, he's spoken at Philly Emerging Technologies for the Enterprise a couple times, once as a keynote speaker, and once just to come down and meet with people and give presentation. There's a regular presentation like anybody else. Um, so he's very open. He wants to see what the community is doing. So we're going to talk about where Java is heading in the next 25 years. If we could put a crystal ball out there, this is the current view as to where Java as a language and a platform is heading and the things that make up the Java community process for how Java moves from where it is today through incremental changes down the road. Uh, we'll talk about some different projects like uh, Project Amber, Project Loom, Project Valhalla, which are different projects in the open process that build different features for Java. It's going to be a really interesting talk. Uh, I really want to hear what he has to say. And we, we kind of pre-interviewed it yesterday and I'm really excited to, to share this information with everybody. So, and then afterwards, we're going to use a tool called gather, uh, for a zoom happy hour. So, you know, we're going to get out there and talk about, uh, you know, what's going on, uh, in our own lives, just kind of chat with each other and, and ask questions. Um, it's probably too late for you to take advantage of the discounts unless you live in Philly, but we will be sending along discounts for La Colombe for coffee and Workhorse Brewing for Vanilla Coffee Porter. So if you're in Philly, get this done now because <laughs> um, you can get some drinks to bring with you to happy hour and relax on Zoom. All right. It's really not Zoom. It's on a tool called uh, Gather for that part, but hopefully you join us. And that is that. All right. So let's get to the topics at hand, I guess. So, Michael. Yes. Let's Ken. talk. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about uh, user experience and, uh, uh, you know, the, the whole realm of design. Uh, as a company, we do a lot of software development. We've had developers who are a little more uh, comfortable with design, at least at the web level, that have done the user interface stuff and taken 
uh, designs and implemented them, or some some of them have actually done designs before we we brought into practice, um, and have, have done them more from a developer who's good at design uh, perspective. But you know, you and um, Pete uh, have added this practice to Chariot. But before we get into what Chariot does with design, let's talk about your path. So, what was your path into doing user experience and design? Um. So my path was not as traditional as like Jack's was last week. I, like in college, I was at Pitt. I was in the business school, major in marketing, minor in studio arts, really didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I loved making projects. So I was thinking maybe advertising. Mm -hmm. And I started my career in marketing, developed graphic design skills, uh, picked up web development and design, uh, transitioned to digital marketing. And then um, I, that was still cool, but I really knew that it wasn't for me. So I kept looking and kind of stumbled onto UX design. And that's where I kind of learned, like, I already sort of have the foundation of everything you need for it. It's just about harnessing that. And at that point, it was like, okay, this is it. This is what I need to focus on. And now I'm here. Cool. Let's, let's start by kind of breaking apart UX and UI design, right? So you hear people saying, oh, I'm a UI designer. And then someone will say, oh, you do user experience or vice versa. Like the terms are kind of mingled together, but let's kind of put a line between them and explain what they are. So uh, what is a UX designer or, or a, a UI designer? Like how does the, how does the, how do the disciplines break down uh, and work with each other? Sure. So, I mean, this is kind of what I was hinting at earlier with my title is the, the titles and the, the labels are, really all over the place and from company mm -hmm. to company they may vary in general most people would say that ui is part of the ux so the user interface is part of the user experience the user experience is more encompassing of everything that the, the potential customer or user could touch whereas the interface is just the means which is for most software is, is a graphical user interface okay so when you work uh, on a project, you know, you're, you're, you and, and Pete or either one of you get engaged in a project and you're typically doing some work in the beginning, um, it's not just obviously the software in the beginning, although the software is kind of a mechanism. But, uh, you know, what are some of the types of things that you start in a project to, to kind of open up the discussions to figure out what people want? That, that's a good question. So I, I, it really depends on the project. Everything is unique and mm -hmm. there's no one point to start at or one one process it it really depends on what, what the problems are what you're trying to do what you're trying to fix or solve or make um, that there's a a very popular process called design thinking where um, it, like the most most common version of it is empathize define ideate prototype test so it's a, a five stage process that's non-linear like it, in general it goes in that order but at any point you may have to iterate back to another, to a previous phase. So it, it's really like for human-centered design, it's really about understanding your customers or your users. And from there, when, once you empathize and know what, what they want to do, what they need, whatever it is you're trying to make for them, then you can figure out what the problems are that you, you want to solve. And then ideate solutions for the problems and prototype and see if what, what you were doing made any sense. Right, and you know, one of the things that, you know, and. It all of developers that I can think of over, over the years, especially when we got into web development where there's actually a human interface that you're dealing with, an interaction, as opposed to you know engineering stuff behind the firewall that no one sees. You work with some sort of requirements and business level uh, interfacing as a software engineer all the time. Uh, and you're, you know, as an engineer, you're trying to translating the tech to the business and vice versa. Um, especially tech leads do that and people that do more of the business analysis. But now involving the designer, it's nicer because you actually do really get kind of nice, decent fidelity mock-ups of things. And you know that you've gone through the scenarios enough with the customer to, you know, try different angles and see what all the different types of people are that are working on the project. Um, you know, so, so let's talk a little bit about some of the tools that you end up using around this, right? So you're, you know, again, early on, as you're kind of ideating and thinking through stuff and designing stuff uh, at, at the conceptual level, what kind of tools do you bring to bear? So often it's uh, like brainstorming and whiteboarding and uh, 
I, I use a digital whiteboard a lot called Miro. There, there's a bunch of others out there. This isn't a plug for anything, but that, that's very popular, especially now with everyone being remote. You can kind of show what you're working on. Everyone can collaborate in one place. And that's great for low fidelity or just uh, recording ideas or thoughts and canvases, th those sorts of templates. Um, and then when when you think you have everything, you got your wireframes, your low fidelity wireframes made, then it, you can use another tool like Sketch or Figma or uh, Adobe XD or something like that to make it the, the pixel perfect vision and a prototype, like a clickable prototype so that the the stakeholders, the developers, anyone involved could see the the interactions and really get an idea of what it is that we're trying to make. Yeah, and I find going through those scenarios are, is the key thing because you can tell someone all day with a static prototype, here's what the screens look like and they'll glaze over. But when they have to actually walk through it with you and see it in action to some degree to say, oh, when we go from this click, it goes to this dialogue, you fill this information out, go back to this place. They might say, you know what, that's not really the flow we need. We really need this interstitial thing because we need to show a legal agreement or maybe we, we would like to have less clicks or what have you. So it's getting them to engage more, right? That's the real right. key. Yeah, definitely that. And also, um, like I heard a developer say the other day in reference to a prototype that this is the best documentation I could have. It's yeah. just th this, this is what I need to make. It's very true because if you... You know, and I've been in the world earlier when, you know, I used tools to build prototypes that were my software engineering tools. So you'd sit there in Java to build a prototype in Java to prove out that you knew what the user interface was. And that took a lot of time. But a lot of these tools are faster to do that with. Right. You've got yeah, a right. Quick turnaround. And that's the beauty of it, like especially with this, like even the design thinking process of prototyping and testing. That way you can see what. If, if the thing that you're going to have this team of developers spend time and resources to build is going to work or has interest. Whereas if, if you don't, you don't prototype, you just skip all of that and they just start coding and make something that it could be perfectly developed. But if it's not what the user wants or needs that that's not good for anybody. Right. I, I, I know most developers, hate that that feeling of why am I doing this? No one's going to use this. Which right, right. Can't blame them. Right, because in in many cases, when something looks complex and it hasn't been vetted by the customer, you can think to yourself as you're coding it, they're going to rewrite this, or they're going to request it to be rewritten. And it's going to be really late in the game, so you don't want to get into that situation. And I don't think text, in general, I don't think text is a great medium for conveying all the nuances of a user interface, right? I think having some text with arrows and to the side of some graphics and highlighting things is so much better. It's like being at a whiteboard, right? And so like you right. said with Miro, I know we've used Miro with you and, and, and it's been great because here's the mock-up of the user interface. Here's an arrow going and saying, this should do this. And then there's little notes along the way as you learn things or things need to have some more nuance to them. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like having a permanent large whiteboard, which is kind of great. Yeah, right. The, the annotations make it the just the blueprints for yeah. the, the team to develop against. That's a really good way of looking at it. How you? Um, now here's a question for you. Just talk about practicality here. You're working in a large project or a project that has lots of uh, releases over time. How do you version these things? So, like you might say, for release one, we have these things, but then in release two, we're going to change to something else, and someone might want to go back to release one and take a look at it. Are there any kind of built-in version versioning mechanisms and things like Miro? Uh, in, Not to in put Miro, you on the spot on it, but I, I don't believe there's so much in Miro. That there is, I think, a log of history, but it doesn't mm -hmm. uh, go back for versioning. Usually, what I do is I will save the file, right. save the board as you know, this is the date, and then at, for the next version, make a new board that's a duplicate with the changes. Yeah, and it's like it's really a, a uh, platform or software. As a, software as a service, so it's a web a website where you do that. So it's not like it's in your source code. But I right, want to jump yeah. a little further. Yeah, I want to jump a little further as we're talking about this to kind of talk about the software side of this, right? So you're getting to a point where you have enough information for the developers to start coding. And then I know we've had like Drew DeCarm on our, our program before to talk about tools like Storybook. And what I find really useful is there's a great interface between our, our user interface developers and you guys because you can give them these high fidelity, you know, uh, mock-ups 
they can then take them. And Drew specifically is one of the people that's a proponent of build up your CSS in a way that's componentized so I can drop a widget on a page, use it, and that widget is directly built based on the design specifications that were put together through the wireframes and through the high fidelity prototypes. And what's cool about it is a tool like Storybook lets you do all that stuff and give you kind of a visual design guide kind of for like, let's say you're building something in React or Angular or Vue. So I know one thing that's gotten more popular in our development teams is that type of tool. You know, where we're starting to use like a, a, a tool to prototype the UI without actually writing all the code for it. You know, you're mm -hmm. writing the veneer of it for the components to be used in the screen, but you're not writing all the code underneath it. Um, so that's a, a really cool technique. And also it just helps us for testing. You know, you've yeah. got everything laid out of what has to happen. So you can verify that against the, the design and then trace it back. Right. Yeah. It, I mean, Storybook is awesome. It, it's, it's basically the, the start of a design system. And yeah. then once the component has been made, you then know kind of the building blocks that you have to pick from in your wireframes without more components needing to be created. So it, the, the next round, you, you might not need high fidelity mockups. You might just need wireframes. That's okay. It's these components that you've already built and you already know exactly what they should look like, but that, that way we can just keep rolling. What do you, what do you find in terms of, um, when you're, when you're dealing with customers for the first time, you know, and I know we've dealt with different types of customers. So you, you have everything from small companies just starting up to larger companies that are kind of an existing kind of, you know, platform and they know what they want, but they just want someone to do the work. Um, what are some of the challenges you run into at first when you're working with a client that you have to kind of work through early on in user interface design and UX? Like starting <laughs> project. It's that's always an interesting uh, idea of what is their expectation? What, what do they know about uh, right. creating what, whatever you're making the, the software development process? So it's really it's it's about knowing them, what they're expecting, what they want out of it, what is important to them. Um, just generally working with their personality type, but I, I think really it's if if you can understand, okay. These are the things that will make them happy. Okay, we need to deliver those and everything else. Let's just try to do as well as we can. Yeah, it's always a challenge. Like when you first start a project in general, there's that feeling out the relationship and feeling out what the level of comfort the developer has and what the customer has in working with the developers, the designers, or what have you. So there's always that, whether it's tech or not. But the one thing I do like about having some of this in the front is that you get a chance to talk at their level earlier then you do kind of like with, with just developers coming in on a project, sitting down and, you know, the worst thing is you just started coding, right? I'm just going to start coding something. And there's some of that you can do. Like I can set the base platform up so that the developers can hit the ground running because now you've got these basic things like Docker containers and things to start the app. But like writing actual user interface code before having an actual good review of what they're looking for and how they want it and what kind of medium they're going to want it on. Is it a mobile phone? Is it a tablet? Is it both? Is it, a web page, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, just so much better to get pencils down early on, right? Right. Or at least and keyboards down and pencils up, right? And that, that's one thing that that we try to do with new projects is have some sort of discovery session of yeah, at least a meeting or a, a day of okay, what what is it? What is the challenge? What do we need to do? And there we can kind of figure out all of the high level things. So then we can start to funnel down the, the road that we need to go. How do you deal with, and this is, this is a left curve again. How do you deal with that kind of, you know, we, we talked in, in pre-interview and you talked about like a Venn diagram, right? You've got the business world, the design world and the tech world. How do you keep that? And I'm assuming part of your job in the UX side is to also kind of start gathering some of the terms and such, right? Or at least some of the, 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 the cons conceptual models of things like how do you do that in, in your role? Uh, so you mean like the, the business needs for this particular project, right? And like just learning the terms and things like that and understanding and being able to speak both the language of the developer and the language of the business person. Like, are there, right. are there systems you convey that with that you like Miro is like the main way or. Uh, like yeah. I mean, like Miro that? is a great way to, to at least, have a, a visual representation so everyone can see what what's happening. Everyone's on the same page by looking at one thing. Um, mm -hmm. in, in terms of learning the business, that is 
you know, conversations with the client yep. or just Googling the, the industry and looking at the company's website, looking at any other uh, areas that yeah. I can find online resources. Right. I mean, I know I'm coming at it from a naive question standpoint, but it was more of a, and I think you're, you're answering it, which is there, there's that kind of, you're the glue at that point to help the developers keep moving on requirements that they need to implement, but also to then say, Hey, uh, this is how we've designed this. Are you okay with this customer? So there's the visual language of the design now that's more important than just large amounts of text. And I think I probably just am repeating myself at this point with that, but you know, I don't know if you find yourself putting a lot of stuff in wikis as well. Or is that more of the developer's domain? I, I don't use too many wikis. It usually mm -hmm. um, my, my between the Miro boards, the whatever I'm doing, like a Figma board or spreadsheets and Google Docs. That's kind of usually how I work for my documentation. But nothing wrong and with you, the wiki. Right? Do you put the? Do, I guess in that case, then for some projects, are you using things like Jira for tracking? Like, okay, this piece of the design done, this piece of the design done, this has been approved by customer, that kind of thing. You know, you can certainly do those as requirements as well, um, or you know, issue tracking around this stuff as well. Sure, you, absolutely, you can. Um, typically, I, for design, for at least the, the things that I'm working on, I'll sort of have more of a to do list, or even those sort of functionality that that sort of board you can make in Miro. There's okay. an item tracker board, so there's no need to set up a, another Jira project in that, that instance. Right, because in most cases, it's the designer working through these issues as opposed to a whole team of six or whatever, you know, working through pieces of software. It's more of a figure these things out that need to be built, come up with the design, review with the customer, that kind of thing. Right, so and more of a there's no PRs example. for design in this case. You were saying also like Miro, for example, not to, not to plug Miro completely, but that, uh, you know, I, I usually do my interviews and I do some mind mapping early on. There's even tools like mind mapping tools in Miro. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's a, cool. um, like there, there's like a, the basic tools, like drawing lines and shapes and text and that sort of thing. But one of those is just a mind map, uh, uh element. Um, and another thing that they have, which is awesome is they have a, uh, dozens of canned templates for like, a UX canvas or a, a, a startup canvas or uh, a journey map or a uh, all, all sorts of just out of the box. Oh, this is it. Just fill this out. This makes this so much easier than remembering mm -hmm. what needs to go in here. Right. And so, um, you know, I know you've been uh, doing these internal things where we do kind of a, a share of design concepts with people. When you're talking to customers and you're just getting them started, are there some things that usually you have to keep uh, like going over with people, like are there certain design metaphors that maybe, you know, that have real value, but that they aren't familiar with, for example? Um, yeah, that's a good like, question. For example, I responsive mean, design or something like that. Like you just concept wise that, you know, you put something on one of these things and all of a sudden you rotate it and all of a sudden everything has to reflow. You know, do they want, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking kind of like a, the kinds of things you wrestle with. Um, and yeah, I have to keep explaining. Sure. So I mean, like we were saying earlier, every customer is different. Like so, some of yeah, our customers of are, are, you know, CTOs or experienced developer leads that you don't really have to explain much to while others, it's uh, an individual who has a project. And in that case, it's okay. Are, are you familiar with these terms? This is what this means. This is what we're focusing on. So in those cases, there's obviously a lot more, uh, kind of explaining or handholding. Right. And then in terms of like uh, things you see repeated over and over again, you know, you see the same kind of mistakes or design decisions or lack of decisions of design that you see where you know you can help right away on a, on, on a software developer's project. Like what are some of the things that you've gone and done and kind of done some tweaking to something and, oh, it's so much better because you did that one thing? Who? Um I, I think a lot of it is when that they just jump into the, like, we, we can't afford design or we, we don't need design. Right. We know what we want. Like, let's just yep. start. And then mm -hmm. it, in hindsight, it's, oh, we, we should have thought through a little bit more of this a little bit. And usually when, when that's the case, it's, it's really easy to pick out, okay, can we shift this this way and do these things this way? This will make it a much better product. 
like things like white space and negative space and making sure that the typography is clear, you know, good, well-selected stuff just to make it easier on the eyes or something like that. Or well, so that, that would be UI design and that's, sure. that's often that's easy to help with. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if that's the biggest problem, then that's great. If usually things like flows and the UX yeah. design from a, a, like what you're actually building perspective, if you have to start that over, then you're, you're in trouble. Right. Right. Yeah. Especially if someone hasn't gone through and sometimes we'll pick up a project and you know, you'll, you'll help out with something where I'm not saying you, but just in general, you'll help out with some software that's been written already. And you start looking at the code and you, it begins to dawn on you that no one did that early on, you know, or if they did, they did to a small kernel and now it's huge. And you have to kind of go back and figure out how do I bring this thing back into shape? How do I mold it back into shape? And, you know, a picture tells a, a thousand words, right? It's it's a it's a good way of illustrating what it's what it is or isn't doing right. Yeah, so. right. And like you're like we were saying, it's just if it's just visual that that's usually easy. And right. Like we're if it's lucky. Process, we have, it's a lot more difficult. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, we're lucky we have such good developers here at Chariot that can go. Sure, I can do that if if that's what it needs to look like. Mm -hmm. But if it's got to start over, then that's a different conversation. Right, right, right. How do you feel about, and this is another kind of left field thing for you for fun. Um, how do you feel about uh, built-in design systems like Bootstrap or, um, you know, like uh, Material Design? I I am a big fan of them. Uh, mm -hmm. I uh, If you're a big company and you can afford to make your own Material Design or design system in general, then power to you, but... For so many companies, it's it just, it, that's not where they're going to put the money. And right. it doesn't make sense to for a, a lot of them, honestly, because they have to figure out what the problems are of their users or whatever they're building and focus on that and not making custom components that look slightly different and do charming uh, interactions. It, it's really about making something that a user can look at and know how to use, which if you're using something like Bootstrap, they're, they're most likely going to know, at least at a component level. Yeah, and developers generally, by now, at least web developers, generally know one of those two. They either work with Material or they work with Bootstrap because they're not going to be experts in design necessarily. And it gives them a good starting point with these building blocks to get things done. So um, yeah. it's interesting because there, there is kind of, and we've had this tension internally, you know, when we discuss and like debate things, like there's the, do we do everything from, you know, the base of like a, a reset CSS platform and we build it up from scratch or do we use a design framework? And I think it really is, it's, it's situational too, right? It's like, what developers do you have? Um, are they going to be taking it over? If they're going to be taking it over, what's their background? Mm -hmm. um, and then the question is, is it so radically different? Like you're building a game or something. Or it's completely different from something you would use Bootstrap for, or is it just I got screens of data and dialogues and buttons and grids? I'm not rewriting all that, you know? Yeah, right. And like, it's some developers might might argue that you know you, you shouldn't be rewriting Bootstrap to make it look more custom, or it's got so much extra bloat that you, your site doesn't need. And that might be true for your project, but for uh, especially like a startup or like just a a smaller project, it, it just gets you up and running so fast that it's hard to argue with, I think. Right. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. All right, cool. Um, and then in terms of uh, some of the some of the other things that you uh, have talked about with us internally a few times, like um, the, the concept of like dealing with things like, uh, you know, colorblindness or something in a user interface. Um, you know, there's all sorts of considerations that as a, as a designer, that you have to think about in terms of accessibility, right? That'll come up. Sure. So have you had, you know, like challenges there in terms of design where, you know, reworking a, a user interface to be more uh, readable, for example, was a key thing to do? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, like contrast ratio is a big thing of just mm -hmm. the, the visuals. If, if the text is not dark enough on a light background or if they're both kind of similar, that's a big issue. Um, there, there's a lot of tools out there that you can utilize to just easily check, okay, the, the text is this color, the background's this color, you're good. Um, one, one thing that is sometimes interesting is sometimes clients don't see the value in making that a priority. 
right. which is which is unfortunate. Um, and then there's also it's interesting when it's like nice looking websites really prefer aesthetics over something like accessibility. Like mm -hmm. that they'll they're going for visuals and it like if it's a marketing site you might get away with that. Uh, if it's something else, more of a product, it's really not a good idea. Yeah, you have uh, regulations and rules too, also like ARIA and things like that. That I don't know if, the, if it's the law, but there's there's certain areas where you have to kind of conform if you're a public site that's offering services. Right. Make yeah. Sure that you make things accessible. That you have keyboard shortcuts and things like that. It's really important. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, in Europe, they're they're a lot more strict than here, but mm -hmm. it, it's. Mm -hmm. It's something to strive for. I, I feel like you, we should we should all be doing that. Right, right. Okay, cool. Anything else you want to bring up around like design and, and UX specifically that we haven't covered so far? Huh, put me on the spot here, Ken. I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, like, let's put it this way. If you, if you were going to get started and you wanted to learn about UX, what are some good websites to go to? That's probably a good way to do it. So, so if you're you know, having someone kind of research what goes into user experience uh, design and, sure. human, you know, human design. What are some of the websites that you go to and, and visit? Yeah, I mean, there are so many good resources out there. Uh, the NN group is, they're kind of the, probably the standard for UX. It's um, Norman and Nielsen. Mm -hmm. they, they have tons of blog articles and videos about, their, their newest research and the best practices. Uh, I, I did a lot of courses on interactiondesignfoundation.org. Uh, they, they're a very inexpensive sort of certificate-based uh, uh, program. Um, another thing is just finding medium articles and seeing what, what's trending, or what's the newest thing, what, what particular design leaders or just designers have to say out there. Um, a lot of it you got to take with a grain of salt, but it, it's it's interesting to stay up to, to date. Sure, sure. Okay, cool. All right. Oh, I have one too. So uh, Michael yeah, and I actually just worked on a project together. And when I was working out some of the colors for this client, he would always be like, did you check the ratio? Did you check the accessibility contrast? And like, it was not something that I had ever thought to do before. Um, and now it's kind of a new muscle that I can flex as we're, we're choosing colors and stuff. So um, the website that Michael sent to me that I have bookmarked now is accessible-colors.com. Um, so if you're doing like, I don't know, pink text on a black background, you can plug in those two hex codes and it basically says, is this good or is this bad? Um, is the contrast ratio high enough? So that was that was really right. useful. Nice, that is very cool. <laughs> yeah, good poll. Also, um, you guys have done some work in the community right in the philly community so there's what's the what's the stuff that uh that i am not sure if you do it but pete runs a design focused uh group right a meetup group uh pete runs product tank philadelphia okay so it's uh it, it's you know product based i guess probably a third or a half of the people are designers uh and a mm -hmm. lot of them are project product managers or product owners that product side of the, uh, the development, I guess. But I mean, you get, um, you would get involved early in those same types of ideation sessions and like thinking through and, you know, you know, low fidelity wireframes to get concepts down. And I'm sure that gets involved as you're kind of thinking through what the potential products would look like in their offerings. Right. Some of that anyway. Yeah. So I mean, the, the meetup is more based around just the the product community the of products. Philadelphia, mm -hmm. yeah, and then product owners, yeah. product managers. So it's um, and right. The reason I, I'm throwing I, that curveball at you, right? The reason I'm throwing that curveball at you is it's it's really more of a thinking through like you know the early parts of a a, a product design cycle. You're going to have to have some sort of prototypes to show people. You're going to have to have some sort of good looking marketing site around it. So there's some UI design from the website concept that might get involved, although usually you can get away with a template for that. But also for things like the prototypes, it's be good to kind of walk through some of the scenarios and think through them. And I think some of these same concepts you use on a project probably does do play for some of those earlier parts of a, a company's life cycle too. To oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's it's, all I'm getting at there. It, and that's um, getting more and more hype in the, 
the world of how to use design to solve business problems. Yeah, there you go. Right. Mm -hmm. It's kind of where I was heading without knowing I was heading there. <laughs> so yeah, right. Exactly. So what happens, you get a software developer who doesn't do a lot of design to talk to a designer. Uh, and that's what ends up happening. Some of my questions, they, they tend to get a little bit too deep in the tech. So, all right, great. So listen, uh, Michael, thank you so much. We really appreciate you being on the show today. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Cool. All right. And, uh, if you want to see anything that, the, that they're writing out there on the Chariot blog, you can go over to the chariotsolutions.com slash blog uh, section, and there are articles by Pete and Michael on there. Uh, you can also find uh, videos and such that we've done uh, on, on the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash chariotsolutions, and you can you know Google things like design and see a number of presentations that, that uh, Pete and or Michael have given over the years. Uh, and uh, we thank you really much for being on the show today. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.